Okay, guys, welcome back. I'm here with Alki Gillis, actually, one part of uh, Studio EDI, some of the greatest special effects that you've seen out there. Um, you're involved in so many projects. I mean, there's a lot of modern movies, uh, even some some kind of out there movies that, that, that you're involved in that are rather mainstreamy kind of action movies um, that a lot of people wouldn't expect. Um, what's, uh, what's your kind of favorite thing that, that you've worked on recently? Um, well, you know, it's always nice to be involved in the big movies because they get a, a lot of attention. So it, the first it, you know, where we created um, the look and the, and, and the appliances for Pennywise, that was that was a big hit. And, and it was a great team too, you know, that we had a lot of great, you know, application artists, Shane Zander and Sean Sansom up in Canada who, who actually applied the makeup. Um, it, it was a, it, that, that was wonderful, it was a great movie. Um, but there's also smaller films that we work on that we really enjoy. I don't know if this one's in frame, but this is a character from uh, uh, Sorry to Bother You, which is Boots Riley's movie. I'm from East Oakland. Very unusual, uh, and the film came to us, you know, we didn't know anything about it, and, uh, uh, and it just had, it was a very unusual twist in, in the film. So we love working with filmmakers that have a unique voice and maybe are outside the mainstream. Um, as well. We've got a couple of other movies. Um, uh, Damien Levesque has uh, The Cleansing Hour. Uh, which is a really cool horror, gleeful horror uh, film coming out. And then Ryan Spindell has The Mortuary Collection. We worked on that as well. And these were modest budget films with first time directors and these guys just knocked it out of the park. So it's really exciting, you know, to, I've literally been in the business for 40 years. Yeah. So for me to like work with uh, younger directors who are going to move forward into the future into their own 40 years, right. um, it's just, I don't know, it gives me a very good feeling that, you know, that I can be part of something that's ongoing, that it isn't all about just, you know, my very, very vast and storied career in the in the past, it's also about the future. Right. Cool. Well, uh, on the movie timelines, we actually watch a lot of horror franchises, and I know one of the questions that I wanted to ask you about was that uh, if, if you had a chance personally to kind of like reboot one of the like one any horror character that you could kind of mm -hmm. do, um, and uh, you could keep it in continuity if it was something like oh this would stay in storyline or just start over from scratch. Like, which character would you kind of want to reinvent? N not specifically of of my resume. No, or it could be of anything. anybody. Like you got to crack at any yeah. in the horror realm. That's a that's a big question, isn't it, man? First of all, uh, yeah. you're kind of setting yourself up a little bit because any kind of reboot or remake of anything classic is very risky oh, yeah. uh, and doesn't necessarily get a lot of love from the fans. Um, so my tendency is always to like say, well, what is the, what's the movie that gives you the feeling of that without it being that very thing? That's, that's where my brain goes. Despite the fact that I did a movie called Harbinger Down, which is a direct derivative mashup of Alien and The Thing yeah. set on a boat. But that was, it's, that was the drill for that movie. It was a derivative work. For me, what I love are some of the, um, if I think about like, uh, how would I commit myself to, to a project, what would I, some of the lesser known um, movies that I saw when I was a kid, um, there's one called The Monolith Monsters, I don't know oh, if yeah, you've ever yeah. seen that. Yeah. That is such a weird idea to me, and I love, I'm very attracted to non-anthropomorphic uh, horror characters, Yeah. Um, and that is just sort of a crystalline growth. Yeah, that, that, so and I think rock. Could, yeah. And I think you could do some cool things with it, you know, growing on people. And, and uh, I, I see touches of it, like in um, what, what's the movie, uh, the la or the video game, The Last of Us, which had those fungal headed. Oh things. yes, yes. It's sort of that that kind of thing. It reminds me a little bit of, of, of what the model of monsters could be. But I also love Cal Tiki. You know, Cal Tiki. <laughs> creature in a in a in a well or in a subterranean cave and they had some amazing practical effects in there yeah. um, that I still don't know how they accomplished the, the blob itself. It's got some textures on it that are just incredible. <laughs> yeah. 
But I love that kind of stuff. Another non-anthropomorphic character. Um, so I don't know. There's a couple of answers. Well, that's a good. Yeah, that's a good answer. Actually, I, I think the monolith monsters would be one that would be. Because I don't. I, I don't think fans would be upset about revamping that. No, because very few people. Uh, and it's kind of a dumb movie. Yeah, yeah. With some really great elements, like a lot of those '50s movies are. Yeah. They're very imaginative and very boundary pushing, but they're, you know, they're they're kind of stuck in their in their era. Yeah. Well, that's actually the type of remakes that I like are when they actually take horror movies that maybe weren't that great to begin with. I mean, yeah. they may have been they may have been okay at the time. Yeah. I think that's why the thing, uh, John Carpenter's The Thing, is one of the best remakes because yeah. like the original thing is enjoyable, but it's mm -hmm. not. Right. It's a great movie. Right, right. Um, and actually Although Lance Henriksen would sock you in the nose if he heard you say it. Right. He absolutely loves it. There is that age range of people who, who really, uh, it, it really did kind of change sci-fi a bit um, with more naturalistic. Um, I bet Ridley Scott is a fan of it too now that I think of it because Alien had that kind of Verite, sort of people stepping on each other's lines, fast-paced dialogue, quiet conversations. Yeah. Um, it was a little, it doesn't age well now, but but it was a little less maybe stilted uh, yeah. for its time. But I agree with you that, you know, every, anytime you have a, a professor who has, a, yeah. <laughs> who has streaks and tips in his hair and a, and a goatee and an ascot with a crest on his jacket. Doing science. Doing science. <laughs> I love that stuff. So anyway. um, Well, speaking of practical effects, um, you rather famously were involved in the Thing prequel, and uh, if you haven't seen, uh, if, you, if you go to Modern Man Dynamics uh, YouTube page, you'll actually see their Thing, their Thing creations that did not make it into the movie, um, that were done over with CGI. Yes. So the question I have for you is reversing that. If you could actually, if, if you're watching a movie where they have a creature that is CGI, and if they ever thought, I would like to see that character done practical, um, obviously except when excepting for the thing, like which, which CGI creation out there would you have loved to have seen as a cool practical effect? You know what's funny is there's a movie that we worked on that was this very issue came up. It was the original Jumanji, oh. and we were asked to do spiders. Yeah. Uh, mechanical spiders. Um, and we were like, going, what about the monkeys? Because we think we should do the monkeys, and the, the spiders would be perfect at that time for digital because they're hard surfaced and they're jointed and, and all that um, and we should do the monkeys and we should do puppet insert at minimum puppet inserts of faces and things like that yeah. and that was a no-go because at the time the I believe the ILM machine was kind of uh, ruling the roost and uh, they could call the shots on what they picked and chose um, that would have been one that I wish when I look at it I wish we had created um, perhaps people in suits that could be Posited into the scene so that they're that big, or rod puppets, or at least miniature insert puppets, that sort of thing. Um, but I would also love to give a shot to um, any kind of uh, like talking characters. Like uh, when I've seen some of the Harry Potter movies or, or, or uh, Lord of the Rings, um, even though the digital work is, is generally excellent in those films, I would love to. To do a troll or something like that that's um you know in a harry potter film or a lord of the rings film that is a guy in a suit with a with a great animatronic face and just really get that tactile kind of quality i love forced perspective shots as well which they yeah. did gandalf those are great techniques the time consuming on set so people don't really do them but uh, mighty joe young was a good the rick baker's Mighty J. was a great example of that, yeah. where they actually took the time to do those kinds of shots. I love that kind of tactile thing. So, I don't know, it's a roundabout um, way of answering the question. Um, if somebody has a paycheck to give me, I'll do anything, <laughs> basically anything. Uh, well, hey, well, speaking of that, um, would you like to take this opportunity to apologize for Deadpool and Wolverine's origins? <laughs> Let me say this, <laughs> we put out a, a video on um, uh, our YouTube channel, which by the way is Studio ADI's channel. If you get off this channel immediately and go over there, you can't wait. Okay. In fact, it's just about to start now. The show is just about to begin. Um, I'm just kidding. You. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, we had the marching orders. We did do a long video sort of explaining how like, because people 
people say like, you fucked it up. They do this with the Alien movies too, right? You fucked it up, man. You think you're better than Giger? Stuff like that. <laughs> so then we do some, you know, and really what it is, well, those come from just a, a lack of understanding of how the business works. Um, but yeah, the, the, the thing there is, is uh, on that one is that obviously the new movies with Ryan Reynolds are absolutely the way to go. Yeah. And they're fantastic. They look great. I love those movies. Those might be my some of my favorite superhero movies. Um, but the marching orders on this one was he was sort of a proto-Deadpool. Um, I know we mentioned it earlier, but I actually did want to talk about this briefly as well, too, because, um, again, this channel is about franchises and uh, um, continuity and everything like that. <clears throat> what would have been the future of Harbinger Down if there were any more series and sequels for that? Um, you mean where would the story go? Yeah. Well, I always like the idea that, um, you know, uh, if the this virus, this Carpenter-inspired virus, mm -hmm. would go to various islands in the Aleutians, because those are cool... Uh, locations that are like you know seafaring places that are very desolate so even though it has reached you know it hasn't quite reached the mainland right it's on land and it's hopscotching um, but there's some great uh, environments and, and great like townies in those places and, and local indigenous people and how that factors into whatever their local legends are yeah. and, and all that stuff I think that it could be kind of a fun um, a fun uh, thing to explore and then there's also like tardigrades are huge now tardigrades have become very popular right now. And I was, I've been a fan of tardigrades for a long time and um, because they're so resilient and they're like you know they're just badass little tiny microscopic near microscopic animals really I think I have a file on this it's a tardigrade also known as a water bear and they're cute they look cute <laughs> um, but when you hear that, uh, what was it? Uh, somebody like India or Japan may have accidentally unleashed tardigrades on the moon or Mars or something. I can't remember what it was, but it was like, oh yeah, this is this could come to pass. They're just a very interesting creature, yeah. and uh, I think there's some possibilities there uh, to be mined more fully. But you know. Um, and then also going back, uh, obviously a lot of your projects are things that I think that most people could know about. I, mean, I think there's a lot of things that I could have said like, oh yeah, they're involved in this and they're involved in that. I've watched a lot of the videos and I know that obviously the, the Spider-Man and everything, but there was quite a few things in there that I was not aware of that were kind of fun. Like obviously you worked on the Friday the 13th, the final chapter. I did. The, the not so final chapter. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the yeah. first final chapter. First final <laughs> chapter. I, um, I was working originally for Greg Cannon, who is the extremely talented makeup artist. Um, and he hired me, uh, the crew was, Kevin Yeager was on that. Um, James Cagle is a great sculptor. Um, we had a, just a bunch of really good people on that, um, on that crew. And um, I, uh, uh, Greg left the show and then Tom Savini came on. So now I had a chance to go from a great talent like uh, like Greg Cannon to a legend like Tom Savini, yeah. and um, it was great. It was like uh, oh, I, I, I had two, you know basically two great bosses to put on my yeah. resume in one film, um, and so uh, so we spent uh, you know whatever however many months it was working on that shooting in Topanga Canyon at the same uh, location that Pumpkinhead was shot yeah. in, and and. Um, it was a blast. It was just a, uh, a, a really. A, um, it was difficult. It was a. It was a hard show to, to hack our way through, but um, but it was a lot of fun. And I got to do the you know the machete thing. I got to do the you know sliding down the machete. So I. Mac, that was Jim Cagle's sculpture. Kevin Yeager was painting everything, and Kevin was doing the applications on Ted White. Yeah. But I got to do the, um, the the machete and 
John Vulich was the other great guy. Uh, rest in peace, John Vulich, very talented fellow. Um, but yeah, that was a nice thing to be like, oh, I'm, I, I'm almost exclusively doing mechanisms. I guess I shouldn't say that. I sculpted Tommy's mask also. Um, with the blowhole. I love blowholes. I've been mean, trying to get blowholes in every freaking sculpture I do. And I, I've really only gotten it into that one. Um, but uh, yeah, the Tommy mask was fun. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a great, uh, great experience, a great growth experience as well. Uh, there was also a rather odd credit that I saw in there that uh, I had something I have to point about because whenever people talk to me about some of the most disturbing things they've ever seen, uh, one thing that uh, is out there that comes up is the window liquor video from yeah. Apex Twin, which you're actually in the uh, credits for. Actually. Yeah, uh, yeah. With a special thanks. Uh... But how 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 you can involve in that? Um, it's our friend uh, Chris Cunningham. Chris Cunningham, who is the genius uh, video director, um, was on our crew for Alien 3. He was like 19 years old, and Steve Norrington, who we had worked with on Aliens, who also worked on uh, Alien 3, recommended him, and he came in, and he was just like, he was like this kid who could do anything. He could do mechanisms, and he could sculpt, and paint, you know, any, whatever, you, whatever you put him in front of, he would excel at. So then he uh, uh, went on to become uh, quite a, um, brilliant video director and uh, he came to us to make the masks. He had done a certain amount of work in London. I believe Paul Catling sculpted them and they made a little plaster mold so Chris showed up and said, I've got this plaster mold, could you make the mask? <laughs> so we cast them up, painted them and um, uh, you know did the wigs and all that stuff and then uh, George Duchel went on set with them. Um, and uh, so it was really like, uh, I guess we had a special thanks because it was an unusual thing because we normally at that time we would have said like, well, we need to sculpt them and, and you know, all that stuff. But he's our buddy, Chris, so yeah. whatever you need, you know, and, and, uh, and it was a fantastic video. It's a, it's a great video. It's a, yeah. Well, I mean, between that video and the Come to Daddy video, yeah. they're probably the most horrifying non-horror things yeah. that, that you could watching it yeah. was, like stuck out to me as being great chris is is really you've seen rubber johnny right yeah yeah, yeah no, he's a genius <laughs> don't breathe like that it'll make you feel really strange i'm with you and nothing's gonna happen to you. just calm down just try to all right well actually i want to wrap this up i want to say thank you very much for coming to talk uh with thank us you. and uh you know, sharing some information with my fans out there and uh, i'm sure they're all there as well too please go check out the amalgamated dynamics dynamics it's a ridiculous to say kind of do little, we did we it's a joke name yeah we were like two guys in van nuys sitting around like oh what do we do we left stan winston's like oh god we need to work now should we go back to stan we can't go back to stan that would be that we shouldn't do that and so we formed a company and we were like, let's just make it the biggest, most outlandish sounding thing. So it's Amalgamated Dynamics Incorporated <laughs> and ADI. We thought it'll never be in print or anything. It'll just be our names. And then yeah. years later, here we are stumbling yeah, over the there. pronunciation. I guess that's a little easier to say ADI. So, ADI. <laughs> so go check out their YouTube channel because it is awesome. There's a lot of great behind the scenes videos there as well too. Um, and you'll check that out. And obviously check out the movies that, that Alec is there that is, is working on right now. And uh, thanks again for watching, and uh, we'll see you again next time.